Hello and welcome to Lesson 6, the revision lesson on deserts. So, let's take a look at this map. What question is the examiner most likely to ask? He's most likely to ask us to describe the location of deserts or the distribution of deserts. It's likely to be worth two, possibly three marks. And then we've got to think about how we're going to respond to that question. So, let's take a look at what the examiner's given us. They've labelled on the Tropic of Cancer and actually, in Africa, many of the deserts are located along the Tropic of Cancer. So we could start off with that. In Africa, many of the desert areas are located along the Tropic of Cancer in the northern parts of the African continent. We could talk about Australia and we could say that central and western parts of Australia are largely desert areas. In South America, the desert areas tend to be on the western side of South America between the equator and the Tropic of Capricorn. Use your map carefully when you are describing where things are. Use compass points north, south, east and west and also look to use the continents. When describing the location of deserts, be careful to be specific about your geographical area. So for example, I wouldn't say Deserts are found in Africa. I would try to be more specific. Deserts are found in northern Africa along the Tropic of Cancer. I wouldn't say that deserts are found in Australia. Instead, I would say the desert areas of Australia tend to be central and western parts of the country. And I wouldn't say deserts are found in South America. Instead, I would say the deserts in South America are on the western side and lie between the equator and the Tropic of Capricorn with the Patagonian Desert at the tip of the southern part of South America. Let's have a look at the graph. So this is a hot desert climate. First of all look at the graph. The bars are always rainfall and the line shows the temperature. So instantly we can see that between June and September there is little if any rainfall at all and we can see the relationship is that when there's less rainfall the temperatures seem to be highest. So the examiner is likely to ask us to describe the climate of this desert area. It's likely to be worth three maybe four marks. When the examiner asks us to describe the climate they are looking for us to talk about rainfall and they are looking for us to talk about temperature. Use your ruler on an exam paper to measure off to the left hand or right hand side axes so that you can read the data specifically and accurately. Let's have a look. So if I was responding to this question I'd talk about rainfall and I would say in Q8 the rainfall is low, very rarely reaching above 20 millimetres. The wettest month is in January with 22 or 24 millimetres of rain, whereas the driest months tend to occur between June and September where there is little if any rainfall at all. With regards to temperature, the temperature tends to range between 13, 14 degrees and 37 degrees. And I would talk about the fact that July has the hottest temperature at 37 degrees, whereas the coolest, while still warm, is December and January where it is around the 13-14 degree mark. It's not the best graph in the world but it gives the idea as to how we would interpret it. This question will be quite familiar to you. It's a question about adaptations and how animals and plants survive in a desert area. You'll see questions like this in geography but you'll also see them in your biology unit. The examiner is going to ask you a question along the lines of Using the figures and your own knowledge, explain how plants and animals have adapted to the challenges of surviving in a desert climate. It could be worth up to six marks. Be careful, there's a few pit holes here. Do not talk about predators or camouflage or things like that because that's not about the climate. It would be suitable in a, in a biology exam but it would not be suitable in a geography paper. So to look carefully at figure one, what type of plant is it? Are you able to identify that that is a cactus? How is it different to normal plants? Let's take a look at the other animal, the desert jaboa. It's a small little rodent 
We might never have seen it before, but there it is, a small little rodent. It's got big ears and big eyes. So that gives us some idea as to how it might live and you know the temperatures surrounding it. Let's look at an answer. Figure 1 shows a cactus. These have spikes instead of leaves to reduce water loss through transpiration. In addition, they have thick cell walls to enable them to store water. From my own knowledge, I know that many plants have long, shallow, vertical roots which enable the plant to find water. They often look dead in appearance, but the roots remain alive and the plant flowers when the rains come. In addition, many seeds can lay dormant for a long time and only grow with the arrival of rain. In that first paragraph, I've addressed figure one and I've addressed my own knowledge and I've stuck just to plants. Now it's my turn to consider the animals. Figure two is a desert jaboa. They have large ears which help with heat loss and they have large eyes which suggest they are nocturnal. They come out at night which is when the temperatures are cooler. From my knowledge, I know that the desert lizard regulates its temperature by regularly moving its feet to allow the feet to cool away from the sand. They also burrow into the sand to keep out of the midday sun. Camels are adapted with large surface area to allow the body to cool. They also have padded feet which stop their feet sinking into the sand. Do not talk about camouflage or predators. Remember, the geography question links to climate. Perhaps have a go at writing your own answer or copy out the one on the screen now and just highlight and identify where the marks will come from from the examiner. Pause the video now and either write your own response or copy out the one on the screen and highlight the key geographical language and where you think the examiner is going to give marks. Let's take a look at this question. So the examiner has given us two maps. They've given us a world map and they've given us a map of India and Pakistan. Let's take a look at the world map first. On the world map, they've tried to identify the Thar Desert. And then on the map of India, we can see a larger explanation to show where the Thar Desert is. So the question here is likely to be, describe the location of the Thar Desert. So we might write something along the lines of, the Thar Desert is located just shy of 30 degrees north of the equator. It is located in northwest parts of India. OK, let's think about the Thar Desert and let's try to think about all the resources and uses of that Thar Desert. On the playlist section of my Geography Rocks podcasts, you'll be able to find a video of the Thar Desert Equally, if you watch GCSE pod, you could look at the Thar Desert and then come back to these questions. Equally, in your books or your revision guides or using Caboodle, you'll be able to find information on the Thar Desert linked to mineral extraction, tourism, energy and farming. Plus, you should have notes in your books. Pause the tape now and try to list as many things that you can about mineral extraction, tourism, energy and farming. Good luck. OK, so with regards to mineral extraction, we've got things like marble, sandstone, limestone and granite. Mineral extraction is primary employment, so look to use that phrase in any responses that you give. Energy provision comes from solar power, wind and oil and gas reserves that have been found in that region. Farming is largely subsistence in the area. And tourism comes from new types of tourism, ecotourism, camel racing and camel uh, safaris, as well as the festivals that happen in the desert. This little symbol reminds us that there are challenges in developing in the desert areas. Just working in those temperatures provides huge challenges. Temperatures exceeding 40 degrees can make working slow and laborious. Getting any building materials and resources into the desert is a challenge in itself, as is making sure that there's a population in these areas to do the work that the industry in the areas allows. But one of the biggest challenges facing these areas is making sure that, that any industry is sustainable and that it doesn't conflict with other industries that could also thrive in the areas, 
So for example, extracting raw materials such as limestone and granite and sandstone provides an economic boost to the country, but it can also have a negative impact on the tourism that could be developed in the area. So it's always about balancing the impacts of one element without causing a decline in another economic area. This slide is talking about the causes of desertification, of which there are many and these are just a few. But drought, poor land management, over-cultivation, over-grazing, over-population, uh, deforestation are causes of desertification. However, there are some solutions. If you take a look at the video clip, you will see an explanation of the magic stones. The magic stones are where stones are laid on the contours of the ground by local communities. This practice is well known in areas such as Burkina Faso in Western Africa. The magic stones are laid down on the contours of the ground and when the rains come, the rain cannot run over the surface of the ground and away from that farm. Instead it is stored and it has to infiltrate into the ground, meaning that more water is held in that particular farming area. If the rains come quickly and the water would normally flow with the topsoil away causing soil erosion, the stones can also protect against it holding the soil in place and over time the soil becomes thicker and more fertile because it's remaining in situ. By building these little walls on these contours, the people have found that their yields, the amount of crops that they grow, has increased. In addition, the people feel successful they found a solution to a problem that their community faces. They haven't had to rely on outside agencies or aid or support from anyone else. They've had a problem, they've worked together as a community and they've managed to solve and improve their situation. And that gives them a real sense of pride in what they're doing. The Magic Stones has been a phenomenal success which has spread across Burkina Faso and into many other countries suffering with desertification. There are, however, other solutions, such as trying to plant more trees, making sure that animals aren't allowed to overgraze, and trying to reduce population through education and family planning. Let's take a look at the next page. So this is an exam question, and it says the following. Using figure one and your own knowledge, explain how the impacts of desertification could be mitigated. By now, having watched previous videos, hopefully you're familiar with that word mitigated, which means reduced. So let's replace that in the sentence. Use figure one and your own knowledge to explain how the impacts of desertification could be reduced. Figure one shows an acacia tree nursery in Western Africa. Now be careful in understanding what a tree nursery is. So a tree nursery is where the acacia trees are grown and when they get to a certain height, they are then taken out into the areas and into the farms and then they are planted. Your answer should start off by, there are many ways in which desertification can be reduced. Figure one shows an acacia tree nursery in Western Africa. These trees are important because once they have grown in the nursery, they can be planted into the farms in the surrounding area. Acacia trees, as they grow, will bind the soil using their roots. This will reduce soil erosion. In addition, as the acacia tree grows and matures, it will provide much needed shade so that crops can grow underneath of the trees. Then we need to use our own knowledge. And at this point, we could talk about the magic stones of Burkina Faso. Pause the tape now and have a go at answering this question yourself. This final slide is a revision card slide on the Thar Desert and it says the Thar Desert is the most densely populated desert in the world. It stretches across northwest India and into Pakistan. There are many opportunities. Mineral extraction of gypsum, feldspar which can be exported overseas. Tourism with desert safaris. The energy provision through coal, solar and wind. Farming using subsistence grazing and irrigation from the Indira Gandhi Canal. There are, however, threats. 
extreme temperatures make physical work near impossible, water supply because the annual rainfall is low and it's difficult to access because many areas are barren. You'll need to understand that term desertification which is where land is gradually turned into desert. The causes and consequences of desertification there's climate change, soil erosion, salinization, overgrazing, overcultivation and fuel wood. All of these have impacts on the area. However, there are solutions. Improving water and soil management. The irrigation canal, which means that more of the desert can be turned into greenery. Contour traps and embankments along the contours, a bit like the magic stones giving an area national park status, which means that certain areas are protected from development, tree planting, and the magic stones that we discussed in Burkina Faso. This concludes the lesson on deserts. My name is Mrs Wingham and you've been listening to Geography Rocks.